Ladies and gentlemen, hello and welcome everybody to another series of Planted on Earth talks in partnership with the National Trust here at the magnificent Stourhead. In our latest series of talks titled Cool Design, Sustainable Futures, we're exploring how to design places, spaces and systems which mitigate against the twin threats of human-induced climate breakdown and biodiversity decline. Last summer, for the first time on record, the UK recorded a temperature in excess of 40 degrees centigrade, while on current projections, and according to the latest UN report published last month, the world is almost certain to experience new record temperatures in the next five years, with peaks likely to rise by more than 1.5 degrees centigrade above pre-industrial levels. As we speak, unprecedented forest fires are engulfing vast swathes of North America, and what we previously considered to be once-in-a-lifetime climate events are now almost routine. As we enter uncharted territory, the threats posed to human civilization, ecosystems, eco economies and global infrastructure are only just beginning to be understood. So, in a world which is hotting up, what role does design play in keeping us cool and creating a world where humans can live in harmony with nature and natural systems? Increasingly, we're seeing the role gardens and gardening can play, not only in helping to restore nature and precious habitats depleted by human activity, but also in mitigating against climate change. Approximately 87% hey, of British homes have gardens, equaling around 23 million outdoor spaces, with around 433,000 hectares, or a fifth of the size of Wales, of British land set aside for gardening. With huge potential benefits of nature-friendly gardens, designers are responding accordingly by challenging traditional thinking when it comes to garden design. So, as traditional thinking shifts, I'm delighted for this second talk in this series titled Cooling Gardens. We're able to welcome a panel of experts with unique insights into this growing trend towards wilder, less controlled gardening. To my left, Daryl Moore. Daryl is an award-winning garden and landscape designer and feature writer for the Garden Design Journal. He is a director and founder of the innovative urban landscape organisation Cityscapes, working in collaboration with leading designers artists and London's major institutions to create temporary and permanent parks and gardens that ensure ecological, economic and social sustainability. Daryl's book, Gardening in a Changing World, explores recent developments in horticulture, ecology and plant science and explores how we can design, inhab inhabit and enjoy our gardens and public green spaces for the benefits of our own species and others. And I'm delighted to say that Daryl will be available for book signings in the Fold Bookshop after this talk. To Daryl's left, Dr Sally Goulston. Dr, S Dr Sally is the founder of the UK's first wildlife-friendly certified company, Salek Botanicals. Have I pronounced that right, Sally? That'll do. That'll do. <laughs> Salek Botanicals, which use, uses its profits to conserve nature. Prior to this, Sally worked in the nature conservation sector for over 20 years, most recently as a research scientist at the Royal Botanic Garden in Edinburgh. And I'm delighted to say Salek are part of our botanical market here at Planted Country. So please do go and find them when you, when you finish this talk. And our third panellist is Daniel Coombs. Or Dan, as we prefer, I think, Dan? Dan'll Dan will do. Dan. Yeah, Dan works. Yeah. Now, Dan's a garden design Dan Daniel Coombs' uh, garden design studio is inspired by wild places and the rich history of garden making. Their aim is to create gardens that are loved by clients and cultivate a deeper appreciation of the natural world. They believe that making gardens gives us an opportunity to have a positive impact on how land is managed, creating a biodiverse and healthy environment for the benefit of us all. Having grown up just down the road from here on the other side of Tisbury, in the lovely chalky Nada Valley, Dan brings us a unique and very personal insight into gardening in the land around us. Thank you all of, our, all of you panellists for being here. It's an absolute pleasure to have you, you on Sam. the panel Thanks. here. So let's get started. What, what are the problems that we've created? Where has gardening gone wrong? Can I start that one with you, Daryl? Um, well, gar gardens are a particular cultural artifact. So they're a way that we mediate our relationships with other species, and uh, they're, but they're a particular way of doing it. And we've done it particularly over the last 100 years in ways that we find that now have been you know, quite uh, devastating for, for biodiversity. Uh, if we think about what I call the... the and holy trinity of the three Ps, you know, peat, pesticide, and plastic pots. 
none of those things are good. You know, we, we know about those now and it's become quite common knowledge that these things are quite, uh, you know, uh, bad for the environment. So we had this kind of infrastructure whereby we sort of had a doing harm rather than good. Yet we think we, you know, we talk a lot about the good of gardens. We talk about how gardening is good, green is good, all these sorts of slogans that are going around. But I think, we, you know, we need to up the ante and really sort of challenge some of the practice which we have. Gardening is a ecological simplification. So it's, it's creating planted areas which aren't acting like they would in their normal ecologies. We have abstract plants from different regions around the world, which is got a long and problematic history tied up with colonialism and then we're putting them all into these places where they don't necessarily thrive or want to be so we need to be questioning all of these aspects of what we do in terms of gardening and thinking about how we can be thinking and acting more ecologically Sally how would you um, respond to that I'm not sure if, if it's gar the gardening that's gone wrong I think it's the environmental impacts in the wider landscape like that's what's gone wrong it's man's impacts on the planet in general and it's kind of perhaps changed the way we should be thinking about our gardens and we now have this opportunity with gardens to be thinking about how we can start to maybe mitigate for some of these issues not necessarily i mean you could think of gardens as an aesthetic aesthetically pleasing space or we could be thinking of them in terms of how can we contribute to mitigating for these changes and thinking about seeing gardens as part of um a, an answer to these problems. So rather than thinking of our in individual gardens, but actually thinking of gardens as spaces that, spaces that are linked up. And actually, if we can make our landscapes more permeable and species particularly can, can track their environmental envelopes with climate change, these envelopes will change and move. And if we can use our gardens as a way of helping species to move through the landscape, that, that's how we can really kind of make change for biodiversity loss, certainly. So I think it's not necessarily gardening that's gone wrong, but it's just this opportunity to change the way we're gardening. Thanks, Sally. Dan, I mean, you, you work on some, some big projects in, in the area around. Uh, uh, first of all, your response to the, the problems that uh, you've seen, but also that idea that Sally just touched on, linking up gardens. Are you also seeing people that are thinking on a bigger scale as well? Yeah, no, I think the, I think the process of garden making, I think... It, it, I think it it can be very destructive. And so I think there's definitely an issue there and seeing gardens as installations and uh, and this idea that we change the conditions to suit our plants and we bring in materials to our gardens that are from all over from to different places without understanding the consequence of bringing those gar uh, materials in. So I think there is, gardening can have a negative impact and has that the industry of gardening potentially has got quite a lot to answer for. But as Sally said, there's huge opportunity there because, because I think as we bring it, start to bring an ecological approach to gardening and so we understand our soils and start from a working from a perspective of, well, maybe the challenge for gardening is now, like, can, can we not bring anything in? So if this is your garden, can you just work with what you've got? So can you understand your soil? Can you understand your microclimate? And then can you select plants best adapted for those conditions? So it's a sort of more light touch approach. And I think that those principles can be, you know, I think those can, principles can be implemented on a very small scale in our private gardens. But then, as you say, on, on, a, on a much bigger scale, when we come to managing sort of larger landscapes and said as well, and sort of allowing ecological processes to dominate the system rather than necessarily our decision making or, or our impact being so, so keenly felt everywhere we go. Thanks, Dan. I mean, Daryl, do, do you see that in in urban spaces that people sort of force the issue? They're not they don't necessarily understand what grows around them, I guess, sometimes because there's not a lot growing around them or they're so built up. But what would naturally be in those spaces and how, how important is that to, to understand and to garden really well to understand sort of what the environment around yeah. should look like? It's obviously it's always really important to understand, you know, what conditions you're working with, what the environment is. But obviously cities are, you know, they're cultural constructs and somewhere like London, you know, we've got thousands of years of occupation. So we're working in areas where we haven't had a lot of natural vegetation before. So we're creating novel ecosystems. We're creating something new from scratch. We're working with 
you know, quite harsh conditions a lot of the time. We're thinking about a lot of shade with tall buildings. We're talking about different sorts of moisture where there's not enough or there's too much. We're playing with all these different kind of conditions. So it's, yeah, but people are starting to understand that. And that's what we're trying to work with, when, with the projects that we do and sort of looking at this, how we can how we can think about these novel ecosystems, how we can create them, how we can work with not what biodiversity is there, because often there isn't that much, but how we can bring more in as well. That's really important. And sorry, Sally, you... I, just, I was just thinking that you're, it's, it's great in urban landscapes when you can work with you know, native species, non-native species, and nobody really questions that. Yeah. Um, whereas in countryside, when you're working at landscape scales, you're kind of confined to working with native species. But I think with climate change, we really need to loosen this idea of nativeness. Because the, the, the idea of nativeness is species that arrived here on their own at the end of the last glaciation, before the land bridge closed. If a species was in, you're on the list. If you didn't get over in that time, you're out. And it seems like <laughs> a bit of an outdated idea. And with climate change, surely we would expect species to be moving. Mm. We need to allow species to move. And so I think embracing that and maybe just kind of chilling out a bit about this nativeness idea so long as something isn't invasive, as long as it doesn't need lots of fancy treatment, I mean, let's welcome it, I think. Really interesting point. Dan, I, I, I'm guessing that might be something you agree with as well. You yeah, know, I, 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 yeah, I absolutely do. I think if, you know, I think it's, it's a, the conversation of, often can go to native versus non-native. And I think if, if, if a native plant fulfills both an aesthetic and ecological function in that particular instance, then go native. But there is... As you say, you know, it, 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 it's not just native, non-native. It's also seeing ourselves as outside of this, outside of this process. We are also nature, so maybe we need to see ourselves as agents of dispersal as well, much in the same way as the wind, wind is, and animal, other animals yeah. are. And so, if we're if we're conscious agents of dispersal, then there is, as the climate warms and the species that perhaps you know the, the, the sort of trend is upwards from Europe, that's sort of. Yeah, there may be species, and there's, there's going to be opportunities to plant species, and we're already seeing that, that haven't maybe traditionally grown in English gardens. And I think that is an opportunity to be seized upon and done responsibility, absolutely. And I think it's very exciting. You know, it's, it's, it's quite interesting that if um, an animal species colonizes, mm. so large tortoiseshell butterflies, a species that went extinct, if they recolonize the UK, it'd be like, that's amazing. <laughs> and yet if a botanical species yeah, comes yeah, out, yeah, we're yeah, like, what yeah, is yeah, that yeah, doing? Naughty plant. <laughs> yes. yeah, 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 what are you doing here? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Non-native. Yeah. yeah, I mean, the term <laughs> native has a lot of different connotations in different places. So when they talk about native plants in, in the United States, they're talking about invasive plants. Oh, are they? It's, yeah, it's a blanket term. And the, so if you say, you know, it, well, I'm sorry, not native, but uh, uh, introduced species. Right. They yeah. see them as being, yeah, you know, non-native plants are just invasive. Oh, invasive. Yeah, it doesn't matter if they are actually behaving invasively really? or not. So, yeah, so we have these different cultural contexts mm. we have to work with. And I think the, the history of the sort of different ecological pl uh, approaches in different countries over the past hundred years has sort of reflected these cultural biases as well. And, you know, there's, and so... In the United States, for instance, there's a lot about prairies and that sort of thing. They see these as you know, restoring prairies and keeping prairies. But that whole native plant movement is really built up there. But it's quite a sort of protectionist idea, which fits in with that. You know, it fits in with "Make America Great Again." All this sort. Yeah, of, you know, yeah, you have yeah, to be yeah. careful how the politics and things, you know, cross over. And even the term "native," you know, originally it had its etymological roots in meaning. Uh, relationship through being born so a medieval french like a child will be native to its mother but then by the 16th yeah. century it starts relating to people and that relationship with people we see it thrown around a lot particularly with the politics that are going on here yeah. today yeah. and it becomes problematic so we have to be really careful how we use words absolutely mm. interesting yeah. i'm just coming back a little bit just this idea and what i'd like to talk about is a some of the projects you guys are working on around maybe loosening a bit of control and but but do, do our sort of formulaic imagined gardens with the perfect lawns and the, I say perfect lawns, those sort of Lord's Cricket Ground stripes down and, you know, borders and edges and sort of rigidity about them. And is it, where does that, where did that come from? And I'm talking about sort of culturally, is that, is that, why is that so ingrained in our psyche that we kind of need to be on top of the garden? Well, sort of landscape history in this country is, you know, we can trace it back to the English landscape movement of, you know, designers like Capability Brown and Humphrey Repton. Yeah, yeah. exactly. These kind of landscapes here. Um, and, you know, this is 
appealing to this notion of Arcadia, which was presented through paintings, basically paintings of Claude Lorraine and uh, Nicolas Poussin. So these idealized, <laughs> these French painters painting imagined Greek landscapes. You know, we, we have all these cultural translations and things that are getting lost in those translations all through this process. And then suddenly we're here in this country creating these kind of landscapes based on these. But we also have to remember that these are very wealthy people. It's power, wealth. To show that you can have a kind of manicured lawn throughout a whole estate mm. requires such a lot of upkeep. Of course. So, you know, we have this kind of history. We do have to remember about the kind of disparity, economic and disparity between gardens and types of gardens. So a, a big lawn was a show of status. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. You had to have, you know, I mean, I know they did have sheep and things managing them, but they had people cutting them as yeah, well. Yeah, that yeah. was the big thing. So, but, yeah. I, but I think it's also to do with control of nature. I think a lot of Western thought evolved in the context, and that's going back more to Hellen Hellenistic thought in the sort of polis, you know, Plato in his polis, in his walled city where... Nature was fecund. It was tooth and claw. It was out there. It was it was a sort of dangerous place to humans be to f to be. And nature dominated the process. And so we put up our walls and we retreated into our cities, and we came up with our way of looking at the world. And so what what what, what we found now is we've dropped the walls, and our way of seeing the world has so dominated nature that we see a very sick natural world. And so a lot of the evolution of our thought has now got to. And that, and that came from a very logical sort of logos, you know, sort of logical way of thinking and the, 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 the scientific method of inquiry. And now we're looking at a depleted nature and we almost need to sort of recal recalibrate the way we actually think about these problems because, you know, it's, it's, it, I think there's a lot, there's a more of a sort of opportunity for an emotional and sort of intuitive, you know, way of thinking about the natural world because we're seeing such a depleted situation mm. now. And so maybe we've been called to see it and think about it in a different way and apply potentially or rebalance the sort of, the sort of heady thought process with a more emotional, intuitive understanding of what's going on around us. And I, I think that might also help sort of shift the conversation a little bit, you know. We, we ran a, a talk recently, in fact, which Oliver hosted at, uh, at British Lands headquarters at um, Broadgate, where one of the speakers, David Mooney from the London Wildlife Trust, said a lot of this was born out of fear of nature, essentially. We, and this, I guess this is touching on what you described, kind of retreating behind the walls. We were so fearful of what was out there because there were these big, big beasts back in the day that, that could literally eat at us and our, our families that we... we We've been driven by this fear, but we've become too fearful of nature, and that dis that has disconnected us. Um, Sally, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about um, the the projects that you're working on in Midlothian, what what your um, gardens look like, what your the, the the land around you looks like, and and how you're trying to reconnect with nature more. I'm kind of doing the the opposite of gardening. <laughs> in that, I take. Um, Ar arable land that's intensively farmed and has been for a long, long time. And the, the soil is completely depleted of nutrients. We run soil tests before we do any work on the land and the soil's just completely depleted. You dig down into it, there's no worms, there's nothing. And, um, you know, we, we need these systems to produce the amount of food that we, we, that we need. Um, not saying that's necessarily wrong, but I'm in a fantastic situation that I can go into these um, spaces these landscapes and um, maybe put back a bit of something that was lost. Um, so I basically start with wildflower meadows on these sites and I, d I do just let nature get on with it. So I put the wildflower seeds down and then I allow scrub to colonize, I allow trees to come and colonize and I, it's just hands off and nature does its thing. Um, in some cases, we have herbivores that come and, and manage the sites. So I'm not, I'm not gardening this on a, a small scale. This is very kind of big scale, hands off, but idealistic. I think, I think this is really important, work. Sally, because this is potentially a form of gardening as well. Because if we can shift our idea to gardening, it's a form of management. And, you know, those meadows, OK, the, the process to actually establish them, that's quite intensive. Right. You know, and then the management of them, you've got herbivores, but I'm assuming you're cutting <coughs> them yourself as well to some extent. Sometimes it's, we do, yeah. yeah. Depending on the nutrient load in them. But yeah. yeah, so 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 it's it's again a way, it's a dynamic way of engaging with landscape. And I, I think meadows offer us so much hope because it's it's I, it feels like such a sort of positive interaction that we can have with a landscape that gives you more biodiversity. And so what meadows are brilliant for is that instant positive hits, yeah. that instant positive impact. So you put a meadow in and within twelve months you've got that 
habitat that other species can come and colonize. Whereas if you're planting trees, you've got to wait quite a long time. So it's kind of an easy win when it comes to biodiversity. So, and will you let scrub do, uh, colonize your meadows? So will yeah. you let that build up yeah, over time? Yeah, absolutely. And brambles and dog yeah. roses and you yeah. let it in. Yeah, yeah. 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 And presumably the, the trees come naturally. I mean, if you look around yeah. this meadows here, you can see all the little oak saplings dotted around that the yeah. squirrels... And I, it's, it's great to plan and it's great, great to, to control. Um, but I kind of feel with the, the state of the natural world, if we have an opportunity to get on and do something in terms of conservation making change, you've just got to go with it. Mm. And if I have a piece of land... And I start with my meadow, but nature wants to put scrub in or woodland in. You you just got to kind of let it do it. Mm. Um, but yeah, I mean, t to me, reading um, Isabella Tree's Wilding book was during lockdown was a real message of hope and a real. I mean, it was to me, it was a, a solution to massive scale biodiversity decline that we we're seeing. Um, I, I found it a really joyful book. Um, really, I learned a huge amount, but. There's no doubt the rewild the word rewilding has become quite a polarizing word. For, I'm not exactly sure why that why that is. Guys, would any of you, Dan, perhaps you could offer a, a thought on on why rewild why people seem to react quite strongly to to the word? Well, I think it presents a radical way, a, a radically different way of managing ecosystems, managing landscapes, and I think there's a call to do it. In, in in and 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 it operates on a very large scale, and the keepers of our keep it, the people who own landscapes are often sort of farmers, private. It's privately owned, and so, and and with that comes a level of conservatism, and or or a level of you know you you've been doing things in a certain way for a very long time, and so it makes sense that you're potentially resistant to such a radically new idea, and so, I, I'm sympathetic to you know, farmers, particularly the farming community, to being very resistant to that idea. And and I also think that it's it's applied as a sort of one size, you know, it's, it's a solution for everything. Whereas, you know, we, we need to use the best sort of fertile agricultural land to grow food. But I do think it's incredibly exciting, the idea of our uplands being rewilded, our sort of depleted ecosystems being rewilded, sort of Dartmoor potentially being rewilded, and those places becoming, mo you know, this idea of allowing nature back in and those feeling those processes and becoming a much more dynamic, exciting landscape with, you know, and whether that has, you know, whether whether that is wildflowers and woodland regeneration and re scrub and humans acting as the herbivores, or if that's also in instances bringing back the herbivores and allowing them to manage that landscape, I think that pre presents an incredibly exciting vision you know, for the future, you know, so I find it very exciting, but I do yeah. understand why there is kickback against mm -hmm. it. You yeah, know? But, but in the scientific community, it's such an old idea mm. that when it took off and became this very trendy thing, everyone was like, what? We've mm -hmm. been talking about this for ages. Why is it that suddenly mm. everybody's doing it and talking about it? And it's been on the table for so long. And I think it was when the Nepa state went for it in such a big way. And, you know, the media took hold of it and people were suddenly like, oh, that's an amazing idea. Mm. And lots of people started mm. started taking it up. Um, and it, it's hugely exciting to see that happen. I do think that um, scientists, nature conservationists, they basically just need a really good marketing team <laughs> for a lot of these ideas. If they'd have had one 30 years ago, we could have started these projects, <laughs> you know, way back and, and got it going. So. Absolutely. Well, maybe that's where Planted comes in in that case. But Daryl, I mean, you <laughs> yeah. were talking big scale and, and the NEP estate is a is a hard one for people to get their heads around, isn't it? You're talking yeah. about many, many hectares of land and um, the vast majority of people don't have that sort of land to work with at all if they're lucky enough to have a garden at all. I mean, in an urban situation, what are you seeing um, in cities in terms of, you know, this thinking around how do I garden for nature as much as against it? How, how's that How's that working out? Yeah, with our projects, obviously, we try to bring in as much diversity in planting as possible to create as many different possible habitats, to create layered planting so that it operates like a, a naturalistic planting community. So we're creating them, but we're thinking along these, uh, these lines. We're not creating pictures, we're creating processes. So it's about what's going on, the plant growth and the interactions with other species that's really important. And, you know, we're finding it uh, really positive. The public are really responding to it. They sort of, they, they've heard terms like rewildings. So they've cut, you know, got these buzzwords that they're saying, is that what you're doing? And we say, no, but we're using the natural processes similar to those, what's going on with that. 
and you know they're more they're more open to sort of wilder type planting, which is really good because then you get a real uh, contrast with the hard urban area. The key thing is about framing them so that they don't look like they're uncared for mm. spaces, that they're just spontaneous plants, because that's what people seem you know, object to. Mm. If you show that they're consciously you know, there for a reason and that they're framed in a certain way, it's called cues to care. So you're showing that it's a cared for, looked after space, that it's meant to be there, then people respond to it. And there's ways of doing that. It's about how you frame it with the hardscape around it, how you bring color into projects, all these sorts of things so that people see that it's done intentionally. That's really interesting. Sally? I was just thinking one of one of the, going back to one of the early questions, one of the problems that I think we have with gardens is is the kind of the, the timescales that we think over. And I think it'd be interesting to see what you think about this, Dal, because with, you know, homes, I think the average homeowner mm. moves every 23 years. So we often think of our gardens over these short timescales. But climate change is, is, is long timescales. You know, we need to be thinking about what the climate's going to be like in 50, 100 years' time. And maybe when we are making changes in our gardens, actually thinking over these slightly longer timescales. And anyone can go on the, the Met Office website now and put in your postcode and look at the climbing projections and see what, what is this area going to be like in 50, 100 years time? What are we working towards here? Is this going to be a very wet area? Is it going to be very dry? Is it going to be very hot temperatures? You know, and, and just thinking a little bit about that, I think that would help us yeah. in the future, certainly. Yeah, I mean, it's really condensed in the city because people only stay in, in London in their homes for five years. Is on it average, five years? Five oh, years. Yeah. So Even it's worse. a constant change mm. going yeah. on. And we create, you know, permanent pocket parks. But when we say permanent, we think maybe 10 years because development is so intense that you cannot guarantee that a building's going to be there. Even a building that's 20 years old is likely to be yeah, knocked wow. down if they can put one up. There's going to be 60 stories rather than 10 stories. But so the planting you know, outside the hospital, that's going to stay for much yeah, longer. Yeah, that, yeah, no, these things will stay. Yeah. And that we find that they do. And the thing is, if you do them and they are successful, then that's less likely to happen as well. Sure. Because people yeah. appreciate Things them. like, you know, tree planting, for example. When yeah. people are thinking about the sort of trees to put in, I, surely in those situations it would make sense to be thinking much longer term because that's the... Yeah. environment that a tree is certainly going no. to be existing in. And that's really important in London, it, which is defined by the London Plains, yes. which are all the same age and all going to die off at the same time. Yeah. So it's going to make a huge yeah. impact on the yeah. city, both yeah. aesthetically yeah. and ecologically. So thinking about how to deal with that is a real problem. And Daryl, what sort of species of tree are you planting? You, you, is it all perennial layers or are you doing structural plantings as we well? We mainly do perennials, but yeah. we also use, yeah, we use sort of smaller scale sort of pioneer trees, you know, field maples, Things like that, so uh, um, yeah, hawthorns, things like that, bringing in native. Sort of but for, but trees, for, for the but sort of larger overstory trees, potentially to replace the planes. Oh, for those, yeah. I mean, that's that's council, that's councils and and sort yeah. of the bigger scale stuff. So we're not involved in that sort yeah. of thinking about that. But there are conversations around what's you know the successional well, process for yeah. those. I think um, tree species though is a really interesting area, and think going back to the nativeness idea because trees. Uh, you know, we do need to start thinking about non-native yeah, trees yeah. in our planting, certainly in, in cities. Um, and with ash by dieback recently, it was a really great example in our wider landscape of, you know, all the ash trees are dying and our ash trees are particularly really important for um, our epiphytic populations. And we hold these internationally important populations of bryophytes and lichens that live on our ash trees. And actually the tree with the most similar bark chemistry that these epiphytic populations will survive on are sycamores. And if sycamores exist in our ancient native woodlands at the moment, we chop them down and get rid of them. Mm. And actually, maybe we should need to start thinking about diversifying these but, yeah. wild woodlands so that these species have you know, places to colonize mm. and to live going yeah. forward. I think in tree selection also, we need to be thinking in more granular detail because we think on a species level, but we need to be thinking about particular ecotypes of a tree. So same genetic structure, but has a slight variance. It's yeah. slightly changed because, you know, a tree like at this level on a hill to that level is going to yeah. be different. It's going to be slightly genetically different. So therefore, if you want to use a tree in a particular place, you can really get down to the detail on that. About and we have that information we, now, right? Yeah, so yeah we, we can use do that, it. yeah. So staying on that theme of thinking more long term, thinking about what the future weather conditions could look like in order to enable a garden to be more more robust, I guess, more more able to survive and more likely to flourish in the future. What are the the type of plants, the type of trees that what are what are the what are 
what should people be looking for and uh, for their gardens to be planting you know for the next three four five fifteen years time Dan? Dep I guess depends on the soil condition, sure. but we're looking a lot, especially on, yeah, again, chalk downland plants. So um, I'm, I'm looking a lot to species that can, uh, are drought tolerant and drought resistant. And as, you know, I, I think similar to what, what um, Daryl is doing in, in cities, there's a lot of opportunities and the projects that I'm working on, um, they may be rural, but there's a lot of planting going on in old courtyards and using different substrates as well, similar to what you've been doing, Daryl. And so that, again, pr presents an opportunity to use species that are adapted to very kind of uh, free draining and, and also potentially looking at seeding species rather than planting perennials. So that's something else that we're looking at on our projects is allowing, choosing, a, 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 cho cho selecting a group of species and selecting a seed mix and then seeding that onto a very impoverished subsoil and then watching that process evolve and selecting the plants. So you, there can be still an aesthetic function to that. So you select what you want to keep, but you're allowing that process, the plants almost to select the conditions themselves. So it's sort of taking us out of it. And that's something that I'm looking at a lot more in our plantings and how we use that. And I think that could hold a kernel of, of you, know, you know, I think there's some wisdom in that, taking, taking myself out of the process and allowing the plants to, occupy the niches and respond best to the niches that you present them with. And so I think that there's, that's something that we're, uh, you know, our practice is looking at a lot at the moment. Thank you. Um, Sally, yeah. what, what would you I say? Was just thinking, um, I, I kind of, again, it's about right plants in the right place. It depends on the conditions of the site. But for, for me, it was, it's about, again, this idea of permeability and, and thinking of which plants are in your wider landscape. And perhaps if you have an area of woodlands to the north and woodland to the south, maybe think about the tree species in those habitats that you could bring into your garden that could the species can then use to move through that space. Um, so again, it's, it very much depends on the location. If it's, if it's more kind of you maybe have wetland areas in the wider landscape, maybe creating some kind of wetland area, um, again, for this, this idea of permeability and species moving through. Yeah, looking outside the garden fence, looking into your the wider landscape and, and, and seeing what's what's growing in the wider landscape and how you can bring that into your garden. Daryl, the future yeah, of urban um, gardens? It's really about understanding plants and how they live through their life cycles. Uh, every plant has an ecological range, so it has an idealised niche where it would really like to be, but it, usually it's in a realised niche. It's not quite in that position. So it's understanding that range, that spectrum, where it can occupy different places. And it's not just individual plants, it's how they relate to each other, basically. So creating relationships and layers between plants, and then also the relationship with the soil uh, biota, so all the life forms in there, the bacteria and the fungi, and that's something we're working on a lot and looking, researching into that. Because plants are, don't just exist on their own. They, they need other species to survive. They have all these symbiotic relationships which they've developed over millions of years, which are really important, and that has been absent from gardening before. And that is, yeah, you know, that I see has been really important for the future of thinking about how we work with plants. It's not using plants, but creating relationships with plants where we're partners mm. it's a form of kinship with plants we've got to, we you know they're so important to everything we do in life you know from food materials clothing to the oxygen we breathe you know we're totally dependent on them we need to realize they are kin to us and treat them as such a lovely lovely description thanks Darla. i think that idea of, of soil health and the kind of interactions in soil is so important because I, I really feel that people have come to see soil as dirt yeah. and mm. something bad. Yeah. And you hear parents saying to their children, don't get, stay away from the dirt. Mm. Like, it's not dirt, that's soil. It's like gold. You know, yes. Yeah. Yeah. And it, it's supporting yeah. us. It's supporting yeah. all the, yeah. yeah. Yep. Really yeah. important one. I was, I was to just going to ask about and talk, go on to soil. Um, mm. The talks program we ran last year at Planted Country was, was Save Our Soil. Um, and we had some fascinating conversation, which I never, 30 years ago, imagined would be possible. That you know, but just the the depth of the biodiversity that's living within underneath mm. us. Um, I mean, and, and also interested in um, this the uh, the sort of peat free movement, which more and more people in the audience, I'm sure, will sort of be starting to recognise. And thankfully, it seems garden centres uh, that we visit are placing peat free products at the front of their 
displays now, but obviously needs to go much further than that. Can we just talk, touch a bit about, what, in simple terms, again, the problem? What is the issue with using peat in our in our gardens, importing peat? Well, uh, peats are really specific habitats of particular ecologies, and they store a lot of carbon. So, you know, particular plants grow in them. Not every plant is suited to that kind of high nutrient sort of thing. And that is, it's decomposed plants. They're kept in anaerobic situations underwater. That's how it forms. So the whole industry, and this has been one of the major industry problems, is, is you know, they've been extracting that, destroying these important habitats, these important ecosystems, and putting plants into them that wouldn't naturally grow in them. So, you know, it's not an ecological way of thinking. It's an industrial way of thinking. It maximizes yield. So, you know, it, now the awareness of that is, you know, become uh, a lot more prominent in public life. So we're seeing all these sorts of changes. But we need to look at different kind of mixes in terms of what we're using to grow plants. It's basically an industry issue in terms of growing plants for garden centers, for people to buy. I'm working as a consultant at Beth Chateau's, and we're looking at how we can create different kinds of mixes for different kinds of plants. You know, Beth Chateau's maxim was right plant, right place. So really thinking about that, not where plants are actually planted in the garden, because that's the end point they're going to get to, but how are we going to grow those? What kind of medium are we going to use to grow them in? So really getting down to the nitty gritty of what sort of potting mix it needs and that sort of to um, actually grow properly. And what are the kind of the things that are coming forward, the mediums i mean it's early days so initially started using uh, pre-existing ones but now we're looking at how we can create our own ones and that as well using material from from the site from the garden itself how we can yeah try and keep it as much circular within the site itself the garden and the nursery working in symbiosis great are you using any wool people are starting making yeah. seed mixes out of wool and stuff no, like that you, yeah. no we're not no no no, no yeah. Yeah. It does seem to be one thing man is really good at is going <laughs> into really ancient ecosystems and destroying them really quickly. <laughs> like, oh, peatlands, they take yeah. thousands of years to form. <laughs> yeah. Let's, let's go and dig that up. Yeah. 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 <laughs> you want a bit of that. Uh, yeah, it, yeah I woodlands, mean, let's go and... Da Dan, you, we, we, we spoke last week and had a, I found it fascinating, this idea, and talking about substrates and soils. And, you know, again, I think partly what's exciting about this in a way is some of the this thinking is also hopefully going to enable us as human beings not to work quite as hard. If we get the planting right, we understand the soil, we understand what's around us, we let things go a little bit, we can relax a little bit and just sort of yeah. just take a step off the lawnmower today. Just just take that, make life a little bit more tranquil, that, that tranquility we all search for. But interestingly, you were talking about a project that you're working on at the moment where you're indeed just essentially planting or sowing onto, onto to rubble. Yeah, no, I mean, and, and I, I guess that's that's um, it's crushed concrete, and the client wanted to take all the crushed concrete off. And I, you know, I'm actually not very experienced at uh, planting communities on crushed concrete, but I guess chalk Who down, is? and it's a good <laughs> allegory for, a, you know, it's it's you know, it's got the right pH, similar pH, and so we we I can apply some of those those principles. But it's also, I think, just keying in to to what Daryl was saying about how we actually grow our plants. So somebody used the um, example of we've kind of you know like w we've grown plants it's sort of similar to the way we sort of eat fast food and mcdonald's you know it's sort of we, we we cover them in mp and k and we grow these like really sort of large with big flowers but they need lots of water they need lots of nutrients and they need a lot of soil sort of humiliation just to sort of survive and so we've created we sort of these sort of incredibly unresilient unhealthy plants that I guess, and then that's probably what gardening's got to answer for, that sort of idea of sort of constantly changing the soil, growing these really big plants. And, 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 and the, but the problem with these plants is, is they are totally unresilient. So they do require t lots of input. So they require lots of water and they require lots of nutrients. And so I guess why I get excited about it, you know, I'm, I'm not saying that we all need to sort of plant on concrete. I don't think that's, but it's, it's more the shift in thinking to realize that actually you can grow and maybe actually Maybe, may, I, I think potentially nature thrives on scarcity or biodiversity mm. yeah. skies on um, scarcity rather than abundance. And everything we do is about abundance, is about more and more. And so I think we've applied that logic to gardening. And if, if we go back to this understanding of scarcity, of minimal intervention, then I think actually the result of that is going to be leaner, more resilient plants and more biodiversity. So again, it's just an, that's another shift in thinking. What's really hopeful, though, is 
looking at the soil on the land that I work with, so, you know, I already said before that the land is just so impoverished, the soil is so impoverished. And literally within 12 months, 24 months, the soil is so much healthier, so much richer. We run the same soil tests every year and you just see it, you know, improving year on year. And just a really basic test is, is the worm test, I like to call mm. it, where you just literally dig down. And when I started, as I said, there were no worms. And now that it's just full of worms. It just makes me so happy to see how quickly that can return. Mm. It's got an amazing power of recovery, hasn't it, it nature? Has. And that, um, I mean, just and need to give it a chance. Yeah, I think, I think we've still got a bit of time. If we act now, I think, um, I think it will come back. But there is a the worry is that we're going to push it too far. Yeah. Let's go back to the to the, he, the the title of this talk, Cooling Gardens. I mean, we're sitting here. It's fairly early on in June. It's well into the mid twenties. We've talked about the the heat that we're seeing in the US and Canada at the moment. We saw it here this time last year. Incredibly hot temperatures. We we all recognise now. I think the debate about climate change is over. It's now what are we going to do about it? What are the solutions? So. I guess planting trees in simple terms for gardens is got to be a good thing because just purely for shading purposes, Daryl, is w what kind of trees would you be looking to plant to create shaded spaces as well as the structure and the definition that you'd look for in a garden design? Well, I think, you know, in in cities, basically, there's the urban heat island mm. effect. So, that, you know, heat heats up because it's hard surfaces, these buildings, and it stays there. So you, you get this a lot of, you know, Temperature is a lot more than it is, uh, you know, in the countryside. If you dr you know, if you go into London and you you know the thermometer, you see it dramatically change. Yeah, you know, about five Heath degrees. It's around Heathrow, it's yeah, it just goes up. It? it is. So it's really thinking about that. But I think w with trees, also we need to not be thinking about. You know, obviously, we did talk a little bit about specific types and species, but thinking about how trees interact with each other because it's not just you know having one tree here one tree here isn't what what we want we want them to join up we know mycorrhizal fungi underneath the soil you know interacts between trees and one tree can support a tree a dying tree can support yeah. younger trees growing up so we need to be thinking about how we're grouping trees together i think that is not being addressed yet and we really need to be thinking about that think particularly yeah, yeah. when water is scarce mm. trees will mm. share resources yeah. like water through this mycorrhizal network yeah. so it actually becomes more and more important they yeah. are able to link up like a community that. of trees yeah. rather than these individual exactly. species. Yeah. yeah, and then the different perennials that relate to those as well. Yeah. Creating plant communities is really what it's about. Yeah, and that, sorry, sorry. Go I was just thinking, trees are incredibly water hungry, though, aren't they? Are trees well, the right solution? They're, I well. mean, it's fantastic for humans because yeah. they provide shade for us. But if you take us out of the picture, would trees be? They create habitats for. Yeah, they do, but well. plenty yeah. of other. You can get much more biodiverse habitat without a tree necessarily. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's a le a lukewarm response wow. to, to no trees. <laughs> no, we need to be looking at both, I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah mixed yeah. solution. Yeah. yeah. And and I think they are brilliant at adapt you know, I, I just just the oaks growing across where from where I live at the moment, I, I it, they they haven't fully come into leaf yet, you know. So so there's a lot of the broad leaves, the leaves are out, but there's this community of seven oaks running down a bank and I was walking past them and I was just struck by different to other, the, the lower down in the valley, or they were all fully in leaf, but up here, all of them leaf were in that same sort of state of sort of unfurling, but not unfurled. And the fact that it was mirrored across that community, I was just like, mm -hmm. well, is that a response to drought? You know, a as you were sort of saying earlier, has has essentially a cold spring meant that suddenly everything's opened, out opened up at the same time. There's been this huge rush, all the moisture has been pulled out the ground. And that the response of that intelligent life form is is to limit leaf yeah, leaf wait. unfurling yeah. and just sense. wait until the next rain comes. Yeah. And when the next rain comes, you might find that community of six oaks does the final. Yeah. And, and so, and so, 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 so for us to say that that you know that you know trees aren't good in climate, you know trees sort of need water. I think they've I, built yeah. up adaptive capacities way better than we can understand yeah. to manage. Manage scarcity. I guess know. I was thinking just in urban situations though, where you have so much hard landscaping, and then these species that do need a lot of water, yeah. and you don't yeah, have no, that no, much quite, sorry, entry that, points yeah, for the water. No, no, I can see in that context definitely. Yeah, it's know. thinking about more effective, uh, you know, urban s uh, drainage solutions. Mm. Yeah, that's like right. That. So, so yeah, important yeah. to kind of get that in with your tree planting. It is. Yeah, the Stockholm tree pits, which are a special specific design, which are intended to you know monitor sort of the water intake and things like that. Right. So. 
But even Daryl, large scale tree planting in urban centres could have the opposite because because of shading. So and, yeah. and reflective capacity. So yeah. if we had corridors of woodlands running through our cities, that 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 could have a huge benefit and in for water attenuation and, and yeah. So, yeah. so so maybe maybe we it's it's not just planting random individual trees everywhere it's like let's plant swathes of trees yeah let's that's that's yeah. what we need maybe that's the next thinking on bigger plan. S- bigger yeah. scales yeah. Yeah. yeah 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 well guys listen it's been a fascinating conversation so far i and i'm sure it will continue to be we're going to open it up to the audience in a in a couple of minutes but before we do that just wonder if you might just give us in your view one tip that you could give to the audience um just to improve biodiversity and uh, make your garden more responsive and robust in the face of climate change. Dan, Daryl, sorry. Um, yeah, work with what you've got. You know, don't import loads of things. Don't you know, substrates and that. Work with the soil you've got. Uh, don't add in lots of chemicals, fertilizers, all these sorts of things. Just get the right plants that are going to fit into the conditions that you have. So really working with what you've got. Understanding plants is really key. You know, trying to find out more about specific species that will work in the situation that you've got. Sally? For me, it's, as I mentioned before, looking over the garden fence, thinking about your garden in the context of the wider landscape and understanding a little bit about the ecology of your wider area, what it's important for. You could even go to your local record centre and find out about the species that have been recorded in your area. And I love the idea of kind of picking one of those and creating a habitat for it within your garden is quite a nice way to think about making a bit of an impact um, on biodiversity. Dan? I sort of boringly want to reiterate what Daryl was saying and almost challenge, you know, everybody to, 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 to try and approach, you know, part of their garden with that idea of bringing nothing in and taking nothing out. So can you take, can you create a garden with what you've got? And, you, you know, whatever that garden looks like, that process of inquiry, I think, will lead you closer to a way of gardening that will create more resilient landscapes. So I, I would say that's a sort of almost an intellectual challenge to garden makers. Brilliant. Thanks, guys. Um, so, opening up to the audience, have we got any any questions you'd like to pose to our expert panel up here? Questions at all to the lady in the uh, thank you to the lady in the peach hat. I think if I could describe it, Chloe's going to bring the microphone to you. Uh, just uh, just on the hay bale at the back, next to the gentleman in the green shirt. I use a lot of farmer yard manure and homemade compost in my garden. Would you be against that? Um, that's you're putting in a lot of nutrients, so it, you know you need. It's again thinking about what plants do that. You, you st- they're going to be really dependent on you doing that. So you need to think about: is that what the plant really needs? What is the balance where the plant can? get what it needs without you doing that. So it's less work for both you and the plant. Mm-hmm. You know, it's a li- if you're putting a lot of nutrients on, then it's quite hard work for the plant to process a lot of those as well. A lot of them are excess and a lot of them are going to run off and cause other damages. So, you know, scale back and try and just find the right balance with trying to let plants pretty much do what they want to do themselves. I guess in terms of sustainability, though, they're good, good things to be working with in the garden, right? Well, uh, locally yeah, produced yeah. materials. <laughs> yeah, but it's just, they are really high, you know. High nutrient, yeah. 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 But is yeah. It, if it's also annual cropping, as in you're using yeah. that to create vegetables yeah. and you're yeah. taking mm. the yeah. nutrients out of the ground the whole yeah. time, then that, you know, for, for yeah, yeah, for annual sort of growing vegetables. I, I think and picking yeah. flowers, maybe. I d- I don't yeah, know. Yeah, yeah, when you're constantly pulling out as well, there's got yeah. a, there is that nutrient balance. But yeah. Yeah, maybe, maybe see, maybe test. Can can you reduce that input and see if you get the same output? You know, are you putting too much on? Maybe. I love using it though. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm making it probably. Plants, you know, plants create their own compost from leaf litter. So what you can actually do is like collect from a certain area of your garden the particular foliage that is you know finished basically. Keep that separate and put that back in that same location because you have what's called. Um, home field advantage so the species of bacteria in the soil relate to those particular plants they can benefit from getting that biomass decomposing around them rather than putting it somewhere else where it won't be so beneficial thank you well done you uh because obviously home composting is a great way to reduce waste and a great way to reduce 
just all yeah. our food stuff going to landfill. So I, so I commend you for what you're doing. Any yeah. other any other questions from the audience at all? Yes, to the lady with the grey hat there. Um, thank you very much. It's been such an interesting discussion. I really appreciate you sharing your knowledge. You probably can pick up one from Australia. Um, now, first of all, a couple of comments. I went to a presentation at the History Festival and the suggestion was that there are very few Indigenous trees here in England remaining, as in there's the oak tree, of course. Um, so, uh, so many were introduced during the time of the plant collectors and thousands from America. In fact, I, and you can sort of enlighten me here, the London Plain, I believe, is a hybrid of uh, American plants. I always thought London Plain, it's English. Um, so, you know, sometimes, as you've said, it's a little bit like horses for courses. And this is what we've adopted on our properties, our farms in Australia, because every year we plant trees and, you know, shade for cattle and sheep and, uh, you know, habitat for birds, etc. But, you know, climate change and all that, um, you know, that involves... A couple of years ago, we lost four of our properties to far, first far since we've been married, and lost so many of our trees that we'd been planting over the years. But interestingly enough, the English oak in my garden remained, the mulberry tree, also a lot of the elms that we've planted, along with the indigenous species, they've survived. Um, some of our wonderful endemic uh, eucalypts behind the house, most of them just, you know, full of oil, of course, um, burnt. So in a way, you know, I, I appreciate your advice that sometimes it is, you know, looking at the soil type and what survived and it's horses for courses, really. And, um, yeah, I just appreciate some comments on that as well. Thank you. And Daryl, if perhaps if you could yeah. address that one. And, and yeah. uh, seeing as we've been talking about native and uh, where people are from, where things are from, us just to clarify, Daryl's a proud uh, Wellingtonian from New Zealand rather than <laughs> Australian. But uh, Daryl, can you just respond to that? Yeah, I mean, obviously we are seeing, you know, an increase in wildfires, particularly in Australia and California. So the Mediterranean biome places, obviously we're seeing it in Canada now, which is, you know, which is a different ecology. Um, but we... Fire has always been part of natural ecological processes, particularly in Australia, you know, whether that's naturally occurring or as a f uh, form of maintenance with Aboriginal peoples using that, both in Australia and in Indigenous peoples in uh, America as well. So these things are there, and a lot of the plants in Australia do often require that for their seeds to sprout again. So it's about kind of getting that balance, I think. You know, we have to appreciate that these things are going to be more frequent, so how do we sort of live with that and that's i think that's a difficult thing because it's more of a threat to us than it is to some of the trees a lot of the time you know obviously it devastates our you know our homes our communities all these sorts of things and i think you know a lot of the trees they've been there for such a long time that they do know how to to live with that but yeah but it is about these mixed strategies we have to sort of look to as you suggest sally you I, like to I was just thinking about your your comment about the the number of native tree species in the UK, it's we are embarrassingly depauperate when it comes to our botanical species. Is it 18 native tree yeah. tree wow. species we have? It's you know we're not doing well at all, and it's because of this crazy you know yeah. cutoff that we have for what we consider to be native or not. And it but outside of the vascular plant communities, though, when we look at our non-vascular plants like the bryophytes, we're one of the most diverse countries in Europe, for example, for our bryophytes. Uh, the same for lichens as well. So there are certain taxonomic groups that we can be really proud of, but in terms of our vascular plants, uh, we, we're embarrassingly poor. Thank you. And London, I was just going to say about yep. the London Plains. Yeah, mm. they're from the Iberian Peninsula, so from Spain and uh, Portugal originally. It's Platinus Hispanicus, isn't it? Uh, yeah. yeah so. No, I'd just be interested in, you know, pre-agriculture, pre-farming, intensive farming in that landscape, what that community looked like. And, you know, I wonder if that community would give you any cues to what, what trees to plant or how to manage fire. Um, so that's what I guess. Yeah, that's that's what I would look into, I imagine. Got time for one, one more question. If there's uh, anyone else out there. Yes, the gentleman in the sunglasses. Uh, so 
probably mainly at Darabula for the other two panel members as well. Coming from uh, a gardening area in, in London, uh, any of the projects that you take on uh, constrained by the council on a, on a macro level, um, for instance, by where they would say, we don't want that uh, deciduous tree because of the impact of the cleaning and the, the gutter cleaning, etc., drainage, or the impact it will have and, and the subsequent cost. And do you, and how do you navigate those compromises, which I guess we will have to do as gardeners because we have lawns for children to play on and you could have a meadow, but then they may not go outside. So this is a constant compromise going on between, I guess, the client or the customer and, and nature. Yeah. And for the other two, have you ever had any scenarios where you've had to navigate that compromise at where it's been potentially as well a controversial issue with the client? Yeah, I mean, certainly, you know, stakeholder negotiation and engagement is what takes up most of my time. Um, it, we work with a lot of different uh, different stakeholders from councils, business improvement districts, charities, other kinds of organisations. And so it's managing everyone's expectations of what they want from a site. The key thing is the aftercare of a site. So it's not so much necessarily about trees, but it's about perennials, it's about whatever, because there's always got to be you know, funding for that. So we always try and ensure that there's funding for at least the first three years of the project so that it is managed and maintained. If people don't like you know, things that they perceive traditionally, because we had traditionally neat, tidy gardens and public areas and public parks were, in, you know, think about Victorian parks, how incredibly sort of anally neat they were. Um, but we're getting away from that. So it's about educating people. It's about educating the people we work with and say, look, we can have more wilder things. And, you know, as I say, the public are sort of responding to this and, and appreciating that more. But ensuring that there is this kind of aftercare process and that it does take, you know, time and money to do that. But also because we're cr planting in these kinds of ways that is less intensive, so it's more stewardship than traditional maintenance. You're working with plants, you're understanding what they're doing as part of their life cycle processes and when to sort of intervene and little th bits of tidying that you can make it more accessible for people to understand. It's getting people to really understand what you're trying to do through the process. So it is an educational issue. I um, worked on a project in Edinburgh, putting wildflower meadows into some of the public parks in the city. And we had a real kickback when we were planning the project from the maintenance teams. And actually just sitting down and chatting with them and understanding what the problem was, mm. it boiled down to the fact that the guys who's um, who mowed the grass, that was kind of their, their main job in the summer, they were really worried they were going to lose their, their jobs, their income. And just, you know, opening that up, having that conversation and, you know, working out what they would be doing in terms of their jobs if they weren't mowing that, that grass and were they happy with that? And that kind of resolved the whole thing. But on the surface level, it was just coming back that the council doesn't like this idea, the maintenance team don't like it. But just really drilling down into it and identifying that it's, you know, it's a, it's a person's livelihood they believed was at stake. You can understand then why you would get that kickback. It's a really interesting point and the, some really interesting statistics, of, uh, research that's been done around areas that have been rewilded where employment levels have actually gone up, community engagement's gone up, and actually yeah. it's been a really healthy thing for the economies of those areas. So, yeah. so there's an education piece and there as well, isn't there? In, in the long run, the maintenance team were actually happier because rather than spending days mm. on the blinking sit and rides, <laughs> they could actually do interesting mm. gardening yeah. work. Proper gardening yeah. rather than just destruction That's right. and That's mowing. Right, yeah. There were yeah. still areas of the city that required that level of, of care. So. Lovely point, thank and you. And yeah, and I think it just comes down to uh, at the bottom line, just valuing gardeners. And gardening is is it is an incredible career, and it requires so much intelligence and so much perception. And you know, so it, it, gardeners would requ require, you know, like it, it it's it's a pro yeah, they just require the right uh, level of respect. And I think there was a time when people didn't necessarily respect it as a proper career or didn't pay gardeners properly. And I think as a result of that, now finding you know people who don't just mow and blow, you know, proper yeah. garden maintenance, that's one of the big challenges in our industry. And so finding, and, and so yeah, it's encouraging now, it's all of our responsibility to encourage young people to go into gardening and realize what an incredibly enriching profession it is. Yeah, absolutely. Fantastic. Well, that, that's a great point, a great way to, to finish in, a, in a, a very positive note and hopefully lots of other positive notes to take away and, and solutions and, and ideas to get you thinking about how we all can look after our gardens and think more about nature and the climate when we're when we're choosing what to put in our gardens. So that just really leaves it for me to thank all of our brilliant panelists today. I've absolutely loved that conversation. It's just 
load have been fascinating from beginning to end. So to, to Daryl Moore, Sally Goulston, Dr. Sally Goulston and, and Dan Coombs, thank you so much for your time. Thank really, you. really grateful. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, just to say that, that Daryl will be uh, available in the Fold Bookshop just uh, at the far end of the botanical market to, to sign his brilliant book, Gardening in a Changing World. I couldn't recommend it more highly. It really has been fascinating having you on the panel. So I'll just say thanks now to, our, to the National Trust, of course, for hosting us here at Stourhead. Our AV production team, Pitch, who along with Soul Cell, have enabled this Planted on Earth talk, talks programme to be powered entirely through renewable energy. Thanks also to our friends and other country for helping us to dress this stage. If you've, been, if you've enjoyed this talk, please visit our website, www.planted-community.co.uk for more brilliant articles, interviews and information about the issues we've discussed on this talk today, as well as many of the environmentally focused partners and businesses that we promote. In the meantime, please enjoy the rest of the event and do take time to speak to some of the amazing businesses here supporting Planted Country as we attempt to reconnect people and spaces with nature. Thanks to everyone for watching. My name's Sam Peters, and this has been Cooling Gardens. Mm -hmm.